Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. There will be an ad at the end of this video. However, let's suppose you got arrested. Just try to imagine it. I've never been arrested, but I've seen it happen on television and on YouTube. And if you got arrested and you got something on you, like a cell phone or car keys or a wallet, obviously they arrest you and take you to jail. You understand that those things are going to go out of your possession into the possession of the police. Then suppose they release you from jail. You get your stuff back, right? Well, if you've been watching this channel long enough, you know that civil asset forfeiture, for instance, says you might not get your stuff back. But it turns out that some police departments take the position that, well, we're going to hang on to your stuff for a little bit longer just in case. And by a little longer, I mean maybe more than a year. And by stuff, I mean cell phones. We have a circuit court of appeals here making the right decision after a district court screwed this one up. This is a cool case from the District of Columbia Circuit, U.S. Court of Appeals. Uh, this case just happened. Uh, Assigner and Dozier versus District of Columbia at L. Uh, the Fourth Amendment provides that the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. That is, of course, the Fourth Amendment. This case presents a question whether the Fourth Amendment requires that any continued retention of such personal property must also be reasonable. That is, even after someone's been released. And, of course, there's case law out there that says they can seize your personal effects as long as the lawful arrest is there. But the question is, when they unarrest you, i.e., let you go, don't they have to give your stuff back? Well, it turns out there's been a fight on that, and now this court says... We hold that it does mean you've got to give the property back. The appellants in these consolidated appeals allege that the District of Columbia, after arresting and releasing them without charges for months or years, refused to return their personal property seized incident to the arrests. On review of the dismissal orders for the purposes here, the court assumes that the allegations are true. It doesn't look like, by the way, that anybody actually claims they're not true. So there were a group of five plaintiffs who alleged they were among 40 individuals arrested uh, at a protest in August of 2020. Upon their arrests, the Metropolitan Police Department seized their personal effects, including their cell phones. Plaintiffs were quickly released, and the department neither pressed charges nor sought warrants to search or to continue to possess the phones. And despite many phone calls and emails to the police department and the U.S. Attorney's Office, the plaintiffs were unable to get their phones back. So they then invoked a rule of criminal procedure that D.C. has got. It's D.C. Rule 41G, which allows a person aggrieved by the deprivation of property to move for the property's return. At first, the plaintiffs filed that motion in criminal cases pending in the D.C. Superior Court against other individuals. The deputy clerk of that court instructed the plaintiffs to refile their motion in a new standalone case. After they did that, the district returned the phones of two plaintiffs. And in case you're curious, one of those was 285 days after the arrest. The other one was 312 days after the arrest. In November of 21, the five plaintiffs filed a lawsuit against the district and federal court. They alleged claims under the Fourth and Fifth Amendments and common law conversion. And they sought damages and an injunction ordering the return of their property still held by the police department. Now, interestingly... The common law conversion argument, I've talked about this before. If you steal something from somebody, it means you go over and you take it and you run away with it. If you use force, that's robbery. But if somebody has something in their possession illegally, but they're supposed to give it back to you and they don't, that can be conversion. And so the police came into possession of these phones and these people were arrested. That's legal. And that's what the court said. That's perfectly legal that when they arrest you, they can take your stuff into their possession. When they unarrest you, i.e. let you go, <laughs> and they don't give you your stuff back, well, that could be considered conversion. So that's what the lawsuit said. And they also said they represented a class of people whose property was not returned within a reasonable amount of time. The district eventually returned the other plaintiff's phones more than a year and two months after they'd been arrested. The district court dismissed the complaint. The district court threw the case out. And the reason they did that, they said the plaintiffs had failed to state a claim under the Fourth Amendment, because the initial seizure of the property was reasonable and because any challenge to its continued retention was governed exclusively by the Fifth Amendment. 
And then on the Fifth Amendment claim, which is due process, they said, well, you've got that Rule 41G, which you can file with the court, and uh, said you should do that. And so they tossed the constitutional claims. And then the court declined to exercise jurisdiction over the conversion claim and simply denied the motion for class certification as moot, saying, you ain't got a case, neither does a class. I'm paraphrasing there. <laughs> In the other case, and by the way, if I ever was a judge, I'd put the word ain't into one of my opinions just to annoy people. In the other case, a journalist says he was arrested while photographing a protest in 2020. When he was arrested, the police seized his cell phone, his camera, and other effects. He was released the same day and informed he would not face charges. Despite repeated requests, he's unable to retrieve his property for nearly a year. He sued and raised Fourth Amendment and Fifth Amendment and, of course, basic law claims, such as conversion. The district court dismissed the constitutional claims based on the reasoning of the other case. All agree that the police department's arrest of the plaintiffs was reasonable under the Fourth Amendment. No one's arguing about the arrest. And it is black-letter law that during an arrest, police may seize personal property. So the district's initial seizure of the plaintiff's effects did not violate the Fourth Amendment. So the question before this court now is whether the Fourth Amendment has anything to say about the many months in which the MPD allegedly continued to hold the plaintiff's effects with no legitimate investigatory or protective purpose. The district court answers no. It contends that the Fourth Amendment governs the government's taking of possession of the property, but not the government's continued possession of the property. We disagree. The Court of Appeals says we disagree. And so think about the logic of that. The court says they're allowed to take your stuff. But the Constitution doesn't say they have to give it back. Wait, what? <laughs> I mean, that's actually laughable. When the government seizes property incident to a lawful arrest, the Fourth Amendment requires that any continued possession of the property must be reasonable. We reach this conclusion based on the text and history of the Fourth Amendment, as well as modern Supreme Court precedents regarding the constitutionally permissible duration of seizures, whether of property or persons. The Fourth Amendment promises that the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. We've, down, we've now read that twice. If the right to be secure against unreasonable seizures speaks only to the initial moment when the government takes possession of the property, well, then the district would win. But if this guarantee is instead concerned with the entire duration of the possession, then the plaintiffs win. The bare text of the Fourth Amendment does not answer this question definitively, but founding-era definitions of the word seizure are consistent with both readings. And they actually pull out a dictionary from 1773, that defines the word seizure to include both the act of taking forcible possession and also possession. These definitions suggest the word seizure encompassed both the act of taking possession and continuing possession over time. So it's kind of like we seize it from you, and while we have it, it is still seized. But a narrower understanding limited to the moment of taking possession was also definitionally possible. In this respect, the meaning of seizure was ambiguous in the late 18th century as it might be today. History helps resolve this semantic ambiguity because the Fourth Amendment codified a pre-existing right. And that's from District of Columbia versus Heller, uh, where it must be read in light of its history. And history favors the plaintiffs. Uh, the Fourth Amendment protects possessory interests against government infringement the same way that founding era common law protected possessory interests against private infringement. And the common law authorized actions for damages and recovery of property that was lawfully taken, but then unlawfully possessed. History thus indicates the government's continued possession must be reasonable for them to get away with it. The Fourth Amendment grew out of anti-federalist criticism of the original Constitution. Remember Patrick Henry? Well, he opposed ratification of the Constitution, in part because any man may be seized, any property may be taken in the most arbitrary manner without any evidence or reason. He was criticizing what was happening with crown seizures of personal property, and that was one of the many grievances that sparked the Revolutionary War. Some colonists compared British officers to thieves 
and lamented they would take and carry away their property without cause. By the same logic as a Fourth Amendment seizure of the government meaningfully interferes with possessory interests in property in a way that would have been understood to be an actionable property tort at common law. The plaintiff's allegations satisfy both of those points. MPD meaningfully interfered with the possessory interests by taking possession of the property and by keeping it. The ongoing meaningful interference is self-evident. For as long as the MPD had control of the property, the plaintiffs could not possess it at all and prolonged unauthorized possession of a person's property would have been actionable at common law, even if the initial taking had been lawful. So you might be wondering, Steve, when would the keeping of it be lawful? Well, they arrest you, and they hang out the phone, they go get a search warrant for the phone, they search the phone, they find something on it that's evidence, and they move from there. There, But there's a process there. Did they go get search warrants for any of these phones? No. Why are they hanging on to the phones? Same reason you arrest somebody and don't bring charges against them. It's probably retaliatory, but I could be speculating. I could, I, in fact, that's speculation. You can draw your own conclusions. Modern case law confirms that the Fourth Amendment governs what happens after the government initially seizes property. The police department's initial seizure of the plaintiff's effects was lawful because it was incident to arrests. Such seizures are reasonable to protect the safety of the officers and to prevent destruction of evidence. But here, the plaintiffs allege that the government continued to possess their property for many months after it lacked any legitimate interest in protecting officers or investigating possible crime. After the government's legitimate interest dissipated, harm to the plaintiffs continued to accrue. It is one thing to not have access to a cell phone while spending a night in jail. It's quite another not to have access to it for another year or so. Um, some plaintiffs allege that they had to replace their phones, a significant financial harm. And some allege they lost access to important information like passwords, photographs, contact information for friends and family. So the plaintiffs have alleged that the seizures at issue, though lawful at their inception, later came to unreasonably interfere with their protected possessory interests in their own property. Even if we had to pick between constitutional provisions, we do not share the district's confidence that the Fifth Amendment fits the plaintiff's claims better than the Fourth. So the district that was arguing, the police department was arguing, look, they've always got this due process thing. There's this one rule they can follow. They can follow that Rule 41G, which apparently never works. But why would a district court following a local criminal rule be considered better than following, oh, I don't know, the Bill of Rights? The district argues that a hearing under D.C. Criminal Rule 41G, which allows a person aggrieved by a property deprivation to move for the property's return, and they say that affords constitutionally sufficient process for the adjudication of these claims. Even if a hearing under Rule 41G provides adequate process, the question remains what substantive law would require the district to return property held without justification? We, the court, are reluctant to reduce this entirely to a question of D.C. law, local law, which would eliminate substantive constitutional protection for property rights such as these. As for other portions of the Fifth Amendment, it is unclear whether the government's continued retention of lawfully seized property would constitute unconstitutional taking. Okay, But they're saying, hey, don't even get there. Just stop with the Fourth Amendment. It's an unlawful seizure to keep it. The Fourth Amendment prohibits only unreasonable seizures, which only modestly restricts the government's ability to continue retaining lawfully seized property. Of course, it can reasonably retain contraband or evidence in an ongoing criminal investigation or trial. It can also seek warrants to search seized cell phones or other personal property. Nothing in our holding limits the government's ability to use seized effects for legitimate law enforcement purposes. For these reasons, we reverse the dismissal, vacate the dismissal, and the denial of the class certification, and remand both cases for further proceedings consistent with this opinion. So, again, to make sure this is crystal clear, people got arrested. When they get arrested, all their stuff gets taken by the police, including probably if they're wearing a watch, maybe a wallet, could be a purse, could be a camera could be a cell phone. They take you to the police station. They go, you know something we've decided? We're not going to charge you. It's your lucky day. Go. 
Where's my stuff? Oh, we didn't say you get your stuff back. We just said go. So you wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait. And about a year later, you go, where's my stuff? And they're trying to argue with a straight face that because they took it lawfully, they don't have to give it back. And that is insanity. But the scary part is there were courts out there ruling and saying, well, there's Supreme Court precedent saying the police are allowed to take that stuff off you if it's incident to a lawful arrest. The Constitution doesn't explicitly state it must be given back to you, but there's a lot of stuff the Constitution doesn't explicitly state. But it does say that unreasonable seizures are wrong. And um, if you seized it originally, and that was okay, but you didn't have to give it back ever, <laughs> think about how comical that is. And I mean that in, in, in the... In the sense of the word that it's just a crazy argument. It's bizarre. And so we all know what's happening here. Okay? These people get arrested. Their stuff gets taken. They say, okay, no charges for you. Go home. But we're to keep your stuff. And it's the old thing about, you know, you might beat the charges, but you still got to go to jail. And now you lost all your stuff. And the idea that someone could be without their phone for over a year. I mean, obviously, to replace your phone, right? How expensive is your phone? But more importantly, what's on your phone? All kinds of stuff is on your phone. And by the way, they've had it for a year, year and two months, and they haven't done anything with it? Couldn't they at least pretend to do something with it? I mean, <laughs> come on. And so this is the crazy part to me, is that these attorneys go into court on behalf of the police department and make these arguments, and a district court ruled in their favor. And said, yeah, yeah, the Fourth Amendment says they can seize the stuff. Fifth Amendment says you're entitled to a hearing. And Rule 41G of our criminal procedure says you can have a hearing. Turns out those hearings aren't terribly effective. But we've talked about this before also. And that is the government does stuff. The Constitution says that they must allow you due process when they do things with you under certain circumstances. What is due process? And quite often it's simply that you have the right to know the charges against you and an opportunity to be heard or some kind of process to be heard, okay? And so apparently these people who've had their cell phones and cameras taken can go in and file this 41G rule motion and have a court say, well, no, it wasn't taken unlawfully because the Fourth Amendment says they can take it. it never says they had to give it back. <laughs> Paul, thanks for sending that. Paul tipped me off to that. Brand new case handed down just a couple days ago from the U.S. Court of Appeals to the District of Columbia Circuit. It's Asinor and Dozier versus District of Columbia et al. Questions or comments, put them below. Otherwise, I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. I told you at the top there'd be an ad at the end of the video. Here we are. We're here to talk about flexi spot chairs. And I've talked to you about them before. I've actually spoken about two different chairs that um, I have in my life, and I actually like these chairs, and I use them every single day. So first of all, let's talk about the FlexiSpot Recliner XL6. It's a reclining chair, and it's a really cool reclining chair, and uh, I have one in my living room. <laughs> it's got dual motors, which has independent control, therefore, of the backrest and the footrest, and I'll demonstrate this while we're talking here. And it's got a, a weight capacity that exceeds my necessary uh, weight. Um, <laughs> you can get it up to 440 pounds if need be. Uh, but that surpasses other lift chairs uh, because quite often they don't go that high. But this one has it covered. And the cool thing is that you can sit in a chair, you can lean it back, or you can actually lay it out almost flat. Almost, almost. I'll show you that. I'll run it through the whole range while we're talking here. But here's the cool part about it. It also has a lift function, a lift position. So if you've got older folks in your life, or if you are an older folk, uh, you can actually use this chair and using its controls, get it to stand up and you can just step out of it. And it's pretty cool. It's, it's, it's pretty cool things. I'll demonstrate that also while we're talking. But then it also has massage functions and heating functions. So there's actually two sets of controls that you get with this thing. One of them controls the how it reclines and, and how it stands up and so on. And the other one controls the massage and the heat. 
And I've mentioned before that this is the chair <laughs> that people fight over in my living room. So I love this chair, and it's been in my living room since the day I got it and used extensively every single day since then. So it's affordable. They actually make these, uh, other companies do, and they sometimes cost thousands of dollars. This one is right around the $500 mark. Uh, you can get a deal on that, though, by using a special code I'll tell you about in just a second. But along with its heat and massage functions, it also has a USB port, because <laughs> why not? So if you're sitting in your chair and you need to charge your phone, for instance, uh, you can do that, too. So it's very, very cool. They put a lot of thought into this. It's a good-looking chair. Uh, it's, it's very durable. I like that a lot about it. Uh, but also, for instance, the, uh, the cover, the material is easy care. That's one of the things about furniture is that furniture can get dirty, be hard to clean. This uh, chair is not giving me any problems at all. And there's also a convenient side pocket that you can put things in, including the controls to the chair. So when you're not using the chair or not using the controls, you can stick them in the side pocket. That's fine. But trust me, get yourself a recliner XL6, park it someplace within view of a TV set, and watch what happens because you'll find yourself using this thing all the time <laughs> except when other people beat you to it. So that's a recliner XL6. And like I said, I love this chair. It's in my living room and uh, uh, it gets a lot of use there. So there you go. But I got to tell you, FlexiSpot makes a bunch of other chairs as well. And the first video I ever did about a FlexiSpot chair was about an office chair. And it's called the C7, the C7. And I'm going to show you this chair also. Uh, and, and here's the thing. I spend a lot of time working sitting in a chair. Now, right now, I'm sitting in a different chair because I'm shooting a video. and I only sit in this chair a couple times a day. However, I've got a chair at my desk, and I spend hours sitting in that chair doing legal work. I also sit in one. I've got two of these. i got two of these C7 chairs. And I also sit in one when I'm doing all my video editing. And it's one of the most comfortable chairs I've ever owned, not limit, I'm just, just as far as chairs go. It's a comfortable chair. Now, here's the thing. I used to burn through office chairs because I'd buy office chairs and I'd use them for a while and they'd break. So it got to the point where I'm kind of like, just, eh, I just get used to the idea about just replacing office chairs from time to time. Turns out that this office chair is comfortable and it's durable. And that's what I like about it. It's comfortable and it's durable. And so it's got all kinds of really cool adjustments on it. You can adjust the uh, lumbar, the thing that uh, you know goes up against your lower back. Uh, you can also lock it in different positions. You can also raise and lower the armrests and lock them in different positions. And you can also slide them forward and backward, depending on where you want to rest your arms. And this stuff comes in handy. And what happens is, if you get a really comfortable chair like the FlexiSpot C7, you'll discover that you forget you're sitting in it. I mean, it's, 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 I don't know how to describe this. I'm not sure if you're like me or not, but, but I've spent a lot of my life sitting in chairs, <laughs> going to school, jobs I've had, and, and even, even my hobbies, and now like video editing. And, and you spend a lot of time sitting in chairs, and you notice whether they're comfortable or not. And the comfortable chairs, you, you almost forget that they're even there. Uh, because you're just doing work and you never stop to think like, oh, I'm sitting in this chair because it's just, it's just doing its job. It's got a job and it's doing it very, very well. So the chair has got a support of up to 300 pounds. Um, and I can tell you right now, it supports me just fine, but I'm not quite there yet. Give me time. <laughs> but the chair will support up to 300 pounds. And you can also, uh, you know, like I said, lean back in it, set it up, use it a bunch of different ways. But the key here is that I've burned through so many office chairs, and I actually think I found the one. I, it, <laughs> it took me a while to find it, but I found the one that I think I'm going to be keeping for quite some time. So that is a C7 office chair from FlexiSpot. So you can use my exclusive code, Steve50, for extra $50 off. You can also buy one and get $50 off, or buy two and get $100 off. So we can make 2024 your year of ultimate comfort. So again, we're talking about two different chairs here. And like I've said, and, and I think enough of you know me well enough to, to understand this, I don't just advertise stuff because people approach me and say, hey, do you want to advertise something? I always say I won't even consider it unless I try it and I like it. And so 
think back on how many ads you've seen me do on my videos and about what things. And you realize, oh, he doesn't do that many ads. Does not do that many ads. And there's a reason for that. And that's because so often people send me stuff. It doesn't make the cut. But both of these chairs did. So I first got the office chair. I first got the C7, and I liked it a lot. I've since gotten a second one. I like it just as much. And I've also got the recliner XL6. And again, that's a permanent fixture now in my living room, whereas the C7s are what I sit in when I'm doing my work or if I'm surfing the Internet, uh, whether I'm editing video or whether I'm doing legal stuff on my computer or if I'm just sitting at my desk talking on the phone to people, doing things like that. I'm sitting in my C7, and I love that chair. I, I can't speak highly enough of it. So like I said, I used to burn through office chairs, uh, and I can't tell you how many office chairs right now are in landfills because they did not meet my needs, and I had to replace them, and the replacement would do that too. So here we are with the chair that I'm reasonably certain is going to solve all my problems and very well could for you as well. So use the code to save some money. Use my exclusive code, Steve50, Steve50, for extra $50 off. And you can buy one and get 50 off, or you can buy two units and get 100 off. We can make 2024 your year of ultimate comfort. Questions or comments, put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Leto's Law. Relax. It's only ones and zeros.